to How Not to Be a Paranormal Investigator. Um, I'm Carrie Poppy, and um, I'm very excited about this panel because I'm a pretty rookie paranormal investigator, and I feel like these guys might have some years on me in the investigating world. So first I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves and tell us in what capacity you do investigations. Should we start with you, Randy? Yes. In case people don't know who you are. If you don't, you're in the wrong room. <laughs> We're in the wrong hotel, perhaps. <laughs> I'm not sure. So, what did you require of me, young lady? Uh, if you want to introduce yourself and tell us in what capacity you've done or do investigations. How much time we got? <laughs> For you, all the time in the world. Well, I'm James Randy, as you might have noticed, and uh, I'm a magician by trade who, uh, in the year 1960, decided that it was time, though I decided in advance that I would do that, I would become an investigator of paranormal, occult, and supernatural claims. And uh, I gave up my career as a, as a performing magician and uh, went right into the lecture circuit, and I have been reasonably successful at it since then. I've also got a number of books uh, to my uh, credit, and I guess to my credit, I'm not too sure. And I got a tenth on the way out, which I'm sure everyone here will invest in uh, very enthusiastically. As soon as it comes out, it'll be called a magician in the laboratory. And not that's not lavatory, that's laboratory. <laughs> just in case you were wondering. I've given up that kind of work, you know, I don't clean those rooms anymore. But ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, I guess uh, I will be answering questions during this session and uh, so more will develop about me and my work. Ben? I'm uh, Benjamin Radford, I'm a research, um, research fellow with the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, formerly PSYCHOP. Uh, and I do investigations through them and also on my own. And I've, doing them, I've been doing them for about uh, 12, 15 years now, depending on how you count it, uh, into all manner of weirdness, uh, uh, ghosts, chupacabras, um, miracles, you know, again, pretty much all manner of weirdness. And uh, I got into it uh, from reading about the, the exploits of James Randi, uh, primarily, and, and also Houdini and, and Joe Nickel and others. So uh, that, they were sort of my introduction in, in many ways uh, between Randy and Carl Sagan, they're the reason that I'm here. Banachek? I'm Banachek, and um, I'm actually a mentalist. I, and I pretty much started, uh, well, the same way, reading Randy's book. It was actually The Magic of Yuri Geller back then is what it was titled. And uh, I read that book, and I started to create my own methods for putting, uh, to, to, create, to create sort of psychic-type phenomena. And then uh, Washington University was given half a million dollars to study PKMB, which is psychokinetic metal bending, and that was in 1979. Uh, I was studied for four years, working very closely with Randy behind the scenes there, and uh, they validated me being a genuine psychic, and we came out and explained that during those four years it was actually uh, all an illusion. We were using magic tricks, and that's pretty much how I got started. Now, the last couple of years, um, not so much investigation although there was investigation behind that. And part of that is because now I'm uh, doing the million dollar challenge and we can talk about that as we get into this and what the difference is. Hello everybody. My name is Matthew Baxter. Um, I'm half of the duo of Brian and Baxter. You've probably seen the green ties around. Um, oh, thank you so much, one person. Um, we, I've, been, uh, thank you. I've been investigating uh, for about two decades right now. Um, one thing I think I have over these guys when it comes to books is that I've actually, I'm probably the only panelist here that has actually read all of their books, but written none of my own. <laughs> so at least I've got that going. Um, but uh, the reason I started, I started out as a believer, and it didn't take very long just because I have a bit of a critical mind that everything all these groups were believing just didn't mesh with what I was finding. So every group I joined, I got kicked out of as soon as I debunked their evidence and uh, just started uh, launching out on my own and, and doing my own thing. And that's when I found out that skepticism was the real home for me. You say launching or launching? Uh, well, I lunch quite well okay. as, <laughs> as, as well. Great. So there are probably lots of new paranormal investigators in this room or people who would like to become paranormal investigators. Mm -hmm. What's the most common mistake a new paranormal investigator makes? Watching TV. <laughs> okay, how so? All the paranormal shows on TV, um, there, there's one exception to this that I've seen, but all of them are complete crap. 
They all use confirmation bias all the way through. What's uh, the exception? The exception is National Geographic's Is It Real? And if you've got Netflix, go back and watch it. I think, I, I think quite often... Seven people on that one. I think quite often they don't realize what they don't know. They go in, they say, oh, I'm a skeptic, I've read some books, uh, you know, I've read Randy's books, and now I can be an investigator. And uh, they also don't go in with a little bit of an open mind. Um, and they basically what they're doing is they're doing exactly what the scientists did with me. They're going in with their own bias, and they don't know how to step away from that bias and really do proper investigation. Mm -hmm. In my experience, uh, the, the biggest problem that I, well, there, there's a handful of them, but one of the biggest ones is a lack of, of research. Uh, they, they, they just jump into cases cold and, you know, for example, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll see ghost hunters or ghost investigators who will, they'll, they'll go into a supposedly haunted location and they'll immediately turn off all the lights, which is weird to me. And then, then they'll walk around with, with cameras and, and they'll be hunting for ghosts. And I'll try to explain, well, what is the claim? You have to establish the claim. What, what, is, what, is, what is supposed to be happening here? And they'll completely forget that. They'll be like, oh, there's a claim? It's like, yeah, that's what you're supposed to be doing instead of wandering around the place in the dark. And so they, 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 they don't do the research, they don't do the background uh, work on it, and so then they just sort of you know, end up with this sort of weird non-investigation investigation. Well, now, Ben has just made very uh, evident uh, the thing that I so admire about his approach, that is, prepare yourself. Uh, ask the questions in advance and determine what's going to happen and ask them to decide what the claim is that they're actually uh, pursuing or investigating. So uh, I congratulate you for that, Ben, as I have before. But uh, my concern with this matter is the media itself. In general, the media doesn't give a damn whether what they uh, present via television, in books, uh, in radio, in any way, and in public meetings, they don't really care whether what they're presenting has any truth behind it or not, just as long as it sells sponsors' goods. The bottom line is, will the sponsors be happy with it? And the sponsors will be happy if lots of people are tuned in. Lots of people are exposed to it in the magazines or newspapers or on television or radio. That's all the sponsor cares. They want their product to be named and they want a lot of people to receive that name all at the same time. The media doesn't give a damn. And you've got to remember that. They are not going to be on your side if you're not going to offer them uh, something in that direction, something that they can use commercially. So beware of the media. Uh, their honesty is always uh, to be questioned, to be doubted, not uh, condemned and not uh, refused if it's offered. But be very careful of Greeks bearing gifts, as they say. That's about it. Um, so if you come into an investigation and you consider yourself a skeptic, you think it's, it's doubtful that I'm going to find something paranormal here. How much do you need to disclose to the subject of your investigation? Do you need to say, I'm Banachek and I'm a skeptic? Or um, do you just go in with an open mind and let the chips fall as they may? I, I think that's a case by case. Um, for instance, uh, when I worked with the parapsychologist, it certainly wouldn't have behooved me to tell them that, I, hey, I'm a magician and I'm coming in. You know, when Randy called me years ago and he said, hey, you know, I'm writing a, an article for Penthouse Magazine, Really? Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's on uh, evangelists. Would you, you know, I'm going to be in Houston. Would you like to come along and see Peter Popoff? And uh, had we have told Peter Popoff during that investigation exactly what we were doing, he would have clammed up. He certainly would have been watching us, and I don't think we would have got away with half the things we were able to do to prove that he was a fraud. Um, certainly, uh, you know, I mean, Randy put somebody in there who was a male dressed up as a woman, and uh, was, they were healed of ovarian cancer. We wouldn't have been able to do that if when Popoff said to the man, you know, hey, uh, you're a woman and I'm, I'm gonna heal you of ovarian cancer, he said, oh, wait a minute, I'm really not a woman. So I think you almost have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis. I think there's a case if you have to use their own weapons against them. Yeah. You can't, go, you can't do an undercover investigation if you're not undercover. <laughs> Good logic, right? Notable, quotable. 
Yeah, I would say in my case, it, it, again, as, as Banachek said, it sort of depends on, on the case. It, it, most often, you know, I'm, I'm in a bit of a situation where on occasion I'm recognized because they see me on TV, they see somewhere, like, you know, in Skeptic, and so they, they sort of have this sort of like one eye towards me like, hmm, you seem really familiar. I'm George Robb. Um, uh, and, and, and George has saved my ass so many times. George, if you're here, I thank you. Uh, but, uh, but, but so, you know, so, sometimes you recognize, and Joe Nickel and, and, and Randy, God, poor Randy, I mean, you know, how, you know, they're, they're going to see him coming a mile away. Um, but but, that, but that's, that's, that's the price you pay for, for, you know, skeptical activism and notoriety. But for the most part, when I go into it, um, I, I, I don't, I certainly don't try to hide who I am. I just say, my name is Benjamin Radford, and I, I investigate weird things, and I understand you have a weird thing. Um, and that's... And I get weird puzzled looks by that, but but that's uh, you know I don't I don't try and hide it. I don't come up and say I'm with Skeptical Inquirer magazine. Is this bullshit? Okay then. <laughs> um, but it's a matter of like, you know, I'm trying to figure this out. There's something weird going on, and um, help me help you understand what's going on. In reference to my lack of an anonymity, that's not easy to say. Lack of an anonymity. Name. Yes, uh, and being recognizable so easily, I've gone into disguise modes on occasion as Adam Gerson. I remember him. That's J-E-R-S-I-N. And if you take Adam Gerson and rearrange the letter, you, you get James Randi with any luck at all. But no one has ever figured this out, it seems. And so as Adam Gerson, I wear a reddish brown wig and I dye my beard with a temporary, temporary dye, of course. I wouldn't want to get permanent on this sort of thing. I, uh, in the same color, and uh, I put in a set of false teeth that are grotesque. <laughs> so grotesque that I freak like this all the time. And that effectively disguises my voice, and I never carry around a skull-headed cane. You see, that would give me away, I think, right away. But I've had to go into that disguise, and I've had many pictures taken of me in disguise like that, and many videotapes as well, and you can look them up on on YouTube, because they know everything, along with Google, of course. But I've, I've done that, and I've done it uh, rather effectively. So disguise does work. The greatest thing is in the world is when you know he's Adam Jersen, and you're sitting at the same table with Randy, but yet he can't say he's Randy because he's in this disguise, and then you start up a conversation with uh, believers about Randy and how terrible Randy is. <laughs> just, just, such devilish fun. <laughs> You know, on, that, on that occasion, uh, Steve, you may remember, or maybe a slightly different occasion, at a conference of, of the parapsychologists in Madison, Wisconsin. Yes, you that's that what one? I'm referring to, yep. There we go. Many years, many, many moons ago. And uh, I saw Banachek and uh, Mike Edwards, his uh, uh, colleague at the time, colleague in crime, so to speak. Uh, they were bending spoons and doing various things. And I wandered into this group, and there was a German journalist there with a very heavy accent, and he was making notes, and I walked in, and I sort of looked over their shoulders, and the two guys looked up and saw me, and they were saying, oh, geez, he's going to give us away or something. He's going to make us laugh. And uh, at one point, the, the German <laughs> journalist turned to me, and he said, you know, it just, uh, 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 Randy, man, if he was here right now, he would be really astonished at this. And I looked at him and I said, I believe you're correct. And the, the, and the two guys that were going, <laughs> they were ready to bust. So I had to leave at that point. Baxter? Yes. <laughs> what was the question? Um, no, I would have to agree with, uh, with what Ben said, except for the fact that I probably wouldn't refer to their weird things um, the way he did. Show me your weird things. Yeah, show me your weird things. You get a wide variety of answers to that, let me just tell you. <laughs> but uh, it is a case-by-case -case, uh, situation all the way. Now, uh, I usually get called in by believers that think that they have something strange going on in their home, and uh, I'm honest with them to the extent that I say I'm here to find out what the truth is and uh, try not to feed too much into their, uh, their delusions or confirmation bias and just try to get to the bottom of things. Okay, so it sounds like there's general consensus that you don't have to disclose up front that you're, that you're a skeptic because it might, it might even mislead about you having drawn a conclusion beforehand. Has there ever been a time where you or someone you knew 
didn't disclose that information, and it ended up rearing its ugly head later. <laughs> Silence might be a good thing. Um, well, yeah, uh, yes, I would say that uh, you, you're always going to get in trouble when you withhold information in one sense or another. There's always going to be someone who thinks that what you're doing is wrong. You have to go in, guns blazing from the beginning, completely honest. And unfortunately, that just isn't the way it works often when you're dealing you know, with these types of situations. So if you withhold information, somebody somewhere is going to disagree with you. And if you don't withhold information, somebody somewhere is going to disagree with you. So yes, there'll be problems no matter what you do. Yeah, we had that with Project Alpha, people, you know, bringing up, um, is it ethical to fool scientists, you know, in the name of science? So that became a whole whole thing. It, it quite often, even you as the person going undercover, you go in thinking one thing, um, and then all of a sudden you get yourself in a situation you didn't quite realize you were going to get yourself into. And, and how do you get out of that? And how do you get out of it in, in, in a, a very... Um, uh, a, a way that makes you look good, but yet also leaves them looking good sometimes. I, 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 it's, it's difficult. It's really, really difficult. I know when we work with the scientists, um, I went in thinking that they were going to be the enemy. It was us against them. It was us against them. And as things went along, you know, you start to realize that, you know, they're, they're misguided. They're very nice people, but they're misguided. And you start having a relationship with these people. And you know at some point you're going to have to come out and tell the truth. And you know you're going to hurt them. So that's one type of situation you can get yourself into that you don't really realize up front you're going to when you first start stepping into it. There's other ones, too. But, yeah, that's... that's. And I must say, with the Alpha Project, uh, you know, uh, and giving uh, absolute... Uh, approval of what the boys did. Uh, we, we made an agreement in advance among us, uh, the two fellows that were uh, pretending to be psychics at Washington University, we made an agreement in advance that if they were ever asked after they did a performance, was that a trick? They would immediately answer, yes, and we were sent here by James Randi. So that was an agreement we made in advance. They were never asked. Sometimes the professor in charge of the thing would read letters from me saying things like what they had just done a couple of weeks before. You know, if the, uh, if the subjects you're examining ever do this, that, and the other thing, I do the following. I was giving them good advice on how to catch the cheaters. The cheaters that I knew had just done this two weeks before, and I was giving them adequate advice. Oh, if the kids ever do this, and he would read the letter with great amusement. Can you imagine? He believes that we could be fooled. It just shows you cannot warn the people who already think they know the answer uh, to these questions. And we also made an agreement in advance of, of Project Alpha. We said that if it ever comes to a point where they will be published in, a, in some sort of a group uh, organization or in a scientific paper or whatever, <clears throat> uh, the results of what they think they've found in the laboratory, we will immediately announce it to them. Now, that, that uh, resulted in a rather unique situation. It came to the point where the Parapsychological Association was going to uh, have a big meeting, and one of the features of the meeting was that uh, this university and this professor, uh, who will remain nameless, mercifully, uh, was going to read a paper in which he announced that he had discovered uh, two psychics. Uh, they were young kids, and that was our alpha kids, you see. We found out about this, and I immediately told the kids, okay, we have to go along with what we said we would do. And then I thought to myself, however, if we just simply go to Phillips, if I were to go to Phillips, for example, who I had never met, and I had not been welcomed by him, he already sent me a letter saying, we don't need a magician to help us find them. any fakers, thank you which is obviously not true, he did need such a person. However, I said, uh, you know, if I went directly to Phillips, he might think that I'm just trying to blow up their project. So I let the, the, uh, the intelligence about this, the facts about this, leak to a fellow named Marcello Trucci, who was uh, such a, he couldn't keep a secret to himself at all. So I just let him know surreptitiously through another source that there was, the, the two kids were fakers, and he got the news to them. And we have a copy of the original scientific paper, page for page, the way they were gonna present it, which is very positive. These kids are psychics, no question of it. 
and we saw the improvements they made on it by putting in modifiers like apparently and perhaps and uh, we suspect that all of the little things that they inserted in the thing came down to a paper which had no positive statements in it whatsoever. It was very poorly received by the Parapsychological Association, but it was a much more factual paper. So we did our duty in exposing this thing before it led to some careers being put in danger, for example. I think it's important that when you go undercover that you set up your guidelines in advance, that you, you, you take a look and you have your hypothesis, which is what we did and we had to, um, but you know what your exit strategy is going to be and, and you stick to that as much as you possibly can because at some point as you move through this, your emotions are going to take over and you've got to be very careful that you're not going off your emotions, so try to stick to that strategy as much as you possibly can, that exit strategy, which, which is exactly what we did. And the, the Alpha kids... Uh, often said to me when Phillips was committing himself more and more, uh, pardon me, that's the name of the professor, I slipped, I'm sorry. When he had committed himself more and more uh, to the genuine quality of these kids, they would call me afterwards saying, oh, but Phillips is in so deep now and everything, I don't think he can ever get out of it. And I said, we've got to go along with our protocol because we've got to prove that these people can be taken in by a couple of clever kids who can do tricks. And, uh, but they felt very badly about this, and they, they got to like Phillips, because he was innocent of guile. He was just not very well informed. I would just add one thing to the, the, the question of, uh, of identifying yourself as a skeptic. You have to realize that to a lot of people, they don't know what that means. It's true. They, they, they seriously don't. I mean, if you say, I'm a skeptic, they're like, do you know uh, how many you, claimants I get that you say, doubt things? How many claimants that, that say they're gonna apply, and that, that it always starts out, I'm a skeptic, but I yeah. have this power. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the problem is that the, even if you even if you go into an investigation and say I'm, I'm doing this and I'm, I'm and I'm a skeptic, that means nothing. For example, the ghost hunter guys, the plumbers, they call themselves skeptics. Make yeah. it that what you will. Yeah, exactly. Well, they are. They're also frauds. <laughs> <laughs> they know. Yeah, I said it. Sue me. Um, because we got proof that they are. Uh, now the thing is, is that they, they actually don't believe a damn thing they see on that show because they admit, they've admitted to us, Brian and I, the, the times when they have cheated. They know there's no ghosts out there, but they know damn well what sells to the advertisers too, or for the advertisers. So they're skeptics, sure, they're telling the truth there, unfortunately. There you go. So Baxter, you bring up a good point. How do we deal differently with people who uh, we suspect of trickery in the case of their claim, and then the people who we think are sincere but just misled. Well, I think that, unfortunately, again, uh, is a case-by-case -case situation. When, say, like if, uh, if I was assisting Banachek with a million-dollar claimant, something along those lines, and we suspected them of possibly uh, being uh, a trickster, we would have to treat them identically to the way we would treat someone that we thought was completely sincere. Until we have actual evidence to the contrary, everybody gets treated the same until we have the true facts. Once, once you catch them, once, once you have that evidence, all bets are off at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they've broken the contract. In my mind, they've broken the contract at that point. Ben, Randy, would you agree? Yes, I agree uh, very much with that. Uh, that. It's a good way to attack it, I think. Yeah, I mean, just like what, what, what Matthew said, I mean, you know, it, at the end of the day, it, it almost doesn't matter. I mean, if you're trying to find the truth of a, of a situation, of an investigation, if the truth is that, you know, this is a hoax, then, I mean, it, there, there are essentially parallel paths until such time as you have definitive evidence of hoaxing. At that point, then, then again, you know, all bets are off because uh, they've lied to you. And um, so I, I personally haven't found that many cases of, of hoaxing. I mean, I, of course, we come across them, but for the most part, in the ghost investigations, uh, you know, the B Bigfoot sightings and, and uh, psychic things, uh, and I, I don't know about the others here, but certainly the majority of them are, they're not hoaxers. They're, they, they really think they can do this. I mean, and you, you and Ross have found this as well, so. Yeah. You know, we had uh, talked the other day in the workshop about which group we thought was the most dangerous. And, and this, this kind of relates because the ghost uh, group, they tend to believe and they, they don't tend to hoax things. 
uh, they might push their facts a little bit to try to get others to, to believe them as well. But they, they do tend to believe. It's the UFO crowd that tend to hoax things. Um, and, and, but their belief is so strong that they justify their hoaxing with it. And uh, they will shoot you if you disagree with them. That reminds me that there was a, a man wandering the halls earlier who told me that he believes in UFOs but not in aliens. <laughs> and I said, I can get behind I, that. I, I agree that there are things flying that I don't know what they are. Is that what you mean? Um, so, okay, how, how and when does paranormal investigations become unethical? From the minute you get the phone call. <laughs> It's, there's always going to be someone who disagrees with what you do, and I think ethics is a very malleable term. Uh, everybody's ethics are slightly different. So by us answering the phone call, to some people it's like, well, you never should have even done that. To other people, it's, well, how can you not? How can you not help these people that think they're in danger uh, of a ghost in their house or whatever? Um, it's, uh, it's, it's ethical and unethical from the get-go and all the way through. It just depends on who you talk to. Uh, there's an element in here about the magicians themselves as well. Uh, I was given a, a very prestigious award by the Academy of Mag Magical Arts not long ago, and I gave a speech in which I actually threw the message in and saying, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you here are the audience who are magicians or associated closely by marriage or by, uh, by relationship to magicians. I think that you should all be joining the skeptical community and trying to get rid of the fakers out there who are using the same methods that the magicians use as entertainers, but they're using it to swindle people. And the reaction I got from that was very interesting. About half of the magicians sat there with arms firmly folded. The rest of them applauded me vociferously. About half of the magicians, professional and amateur magicians now, uh, and they're usually advanced amateurs in most cases. Uh, half of them agree that what, with what the skeptics are doing is correct, and the other half say, no, no, these are professionals. Many of them admire Uri Geller. They think that he's just a just sort of a rascally guy who uh, doesn't quite uh, be honest with the audience. He sort of gives hints that maybe he's the real thing. No, he says distinctly, I don't do tricks, I'm not a magician, I don't know how to do tricks, and then he lies to people, and so he's a liar. He's not, uh, not, not a, an innocent uh, dupe of his own uh, abilities at all. But half of the magicians, about 50%, I think it's very close, agree with us, and half of them don't, so beware. In my experience, um, unlike Baxter's, I think that um, I'd say most of the, the uh, investigations that I do don't necessarily involve ethics, uh, a breach or otherwise. For example, if I'm investigating a Bigfoot sighting, assuming it's just somebody saw something weird, you do the investigation and either it is or isn't a Bigfoot or likely to be Bigfoot or you look at the evidence of that. Same thing with ghosts or whatever else. So I mean, many of my investigations, there's no inherent ethical issues involved necessarily, depending on, again, what the claim is. Usually the times when, when ethics has come up for me was, as we were talking earlier, with undercover cases. Uh, there's been a handful of times when I've had to go undercover, um, and in those cases, again, that you, that's, that's when the, you know, the very act of going undercover involves deception, and, that, and that's when you have to sort of you know, be as truthful as you can within the parameters, and, and as Randy was saying, you know, if someone asks you directly, you know, <laughs> Are, are, are you something other than what you're claiming to be? The answer is absolutely yes. Oh yes, you have to be ethical even if they're not being ethical. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we have to hold a certain standard um, even if they don't. And, and, and I try to do that as often as I can. I, I, actually, I do do that. It's not that you just try, you, I think you have to do that. And, and so if, if they do ask you, uh, if you're on a cover, for instance, if they ask you if you're, you know, if you work with the Randy Foundation, I would always say yes. I wouldn't, I wouldn't lie to them straight out like that. That's not, I wouldn't look them in the eyes and say, no, I don't work for the James Randy Educational Foundation. Mm -hmm. I, I would tell them the truth. And I think so, as a result, I, I, I try to, I have a certain ethical line that I try to live by. And um, that also follows through in psychic investigations as well. I'm not going to change that for that. And I must say that the, the uh, James Randi Educational Foundation and the TAM operation that you're present at right now, if, if and when we investigate, as we should be doing later on today, uh, investigate a claimant for the Million Dollar Challenge, 
I assure you that everything is above board, strictly open, everything is done very, very honestly and directly, nothing is concealed whatsoever. And the test that we may be doing later on today, again, it's a little iffy, but uh, if it is done, it will be done with great integrity. I absolutely assure you of that. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm always fully aware of how can I be fair to the claimant. It's not always being just fair to us and making sure that we're aware. I need, I need to make sure that the claimant is comfortable with it. I need to make sure that the claimant realizes that we are not cheating them. It's not just about they possibly could be cheating us. It's about could we possibly be cheating them. So I've got to look at it from both sides. And I'll just, just, just add, and part of the reason is because if, if, if skeptics get a reputation for, for you know, cheating, then all bets are off. I mean, you know, no one's going to yeah. have any credibility if, if, you know, if somebody you know, legitimately applies for the million dollar challenge and they, they get cheated. I mean, at that point, then yeah, if, we, if we stoop to their level, then it, it's yeah. off. So some of the claims that people make, like if they say they can hear voices from other rooms or they see things that other people can't see, sometimes that might be indicative of a mental illness. I'm sure often it's not, but sometimes it is. How should we handle um, the people who clearly do have those sorts of troubles? Do you handle them differently? Do you mm -hmm. just um, ask them to go to a doctor? What would you do? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a difficult one because somebody who's mentally ill could have psychic powers, couldn't they? Mm -hmm. Um, it, well, they could. I mean, if psychic powers are real, uh, they, they could have them. So do we just separate them? I think what we have to do is, you'll know, sometimes we also have to take those on a case-by-case -case basis because we certainly don't want to add to delusions. We don't want to hurt the person. We don't want to seem like we're taking advantage of somebody who might be mentally ill. But at the same time, we can't just totally outright dismiss their claim. Well, of course, if they have a, a claim that can be tested, they can be tested by experienced people such as we are, uh, and it fails, and then there's nothing to discuss. Yeah. After that point, they simply didn't pass the test. That's right. uh, but if, if it could do them some harm, it's always ethically necessary for us to think about the fact that they may be mentally disturbed and something should be done about it. And I think that we have, uh, we have honored that uh, responsibility all the way through. What, what I have found is that the, the mentally, what I suspect are the mentally ill patients, the majority of them, they never get through the application process anyway because it's just pages and pages and pages of ranting and going on and things like that and, and just never, and, and when you do that, you will never get to a point where you can even set up a protocol with them. So they almost, the majority of them eliminate themselves somewhere along the way. And just so you guys know, that uh, when we do deal with someone like that, when it comes to the million dollar challenge, um, I for one, if I'm dealing with them, I keep in contact with a psychiatrist and keep them in the loop on what's going on, what's being said, and how things are being uh, done, just so I can have some professional advice on what we should do. I mean, one of the things that uh, Banachek and I had talked about is if we get someone that, that's at a certain point where we're unsure, but they're completely feeling uh, uh, sure about their own mental status, uh, we let them know that one of the things they can do is get a mental screening as a preemptive, a preemptive uh, step to keep people from accusing them of being uh, psychologically imbalanced. And that in itself is a step towards getting them help if need be. So we, we try to enact what we can uh, to get these people help if we're really concerned, but we try to keep a, a psychiatrist or something in the loop if possible. Yeah. I mean, you can't just outright accuse somebody of being mentally ill. It's, it's, yeah, yeah and, and that doesn't really help either. I mean, I, my, my background is in psychology, so I'm especially attuned to sort of trying to understand and, and empathize with, with, with the claimant. And sometimes, mo most of the time, it's somebody who sincerely and genuinely believes that they can, you know, they can predict the future, they can do this thing, and they're, they're not lying, they're not crazy, they just, they just have developed this whole, this whole worldview. And so in the cases where I, when I'm dealing with somebody who I suspect is, is mentally ill in some capacity, I try and tease out, okay, well, again, is this wrapped up with, with your ability somehow? And, you know, and are there ways in which I can sort of steer them towards competent mental health? I mean, I, I'm not a counselor, I'm not a psychologist, um, and so, and, and furthermore, that's not my job. I mean, ultimately, oftentimes, and I, I'm, I'm guessing everybody here on this panel and elsewhere, 
has uh, has had a case where you begin with an investigation and you sort of end up being their counselors, and you don't you don't you don't want to find yourself in that position because that's not what we're doing. On the other hand, there's definitely uh, a um, a psychological counseling component, even to people who aren't mentally ill, even to just people who are grieving. You know, you know, Banchek had talked before about you know the the the, the grief vampires and Sylvia Brown and these people who who you know prey on people whose whose family members are dead, and there's. That, you know, that's not mental illness, but in some ways, you know, the way it can manifest itself, it can be very similar. So Ben, and then everybody else as well, um, is there a point at which you should give up on an investigation? Uh, are, there, are there times when you felt like, I need to withdraw because I may be doing more harm than good? Well, you have to have perfectly good reasons for giving it up. Otherwise, they say, oh, they know that I've got the powers, and they're afraid of investigating. You've got to protect yourself in that respect. Mm -hmm. When it comes to uh, investigating things like haunted houses or ghost claims, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure Ben can relate to this, that people will get very attached to you. You're, you're the person that brought them the solution, so now they, they will try to have you solve every one of their problems. And you do have to have a point where you just pull out and say, that's it. And of course, it usually comes with a lot of anger from them. But uh, we, we are, we're in there in a very sensitive situation. And uh, it brings up a big ethical question of whether or not some of these residential investigations should be done at all. Uh, I, I think that they should, but it's how they get done that's the scary part. When you're the fourth paranormal investigator to be at their house and the previous three have all confirmed the demon gateway in the closet, um, you're really dealing with some uh, difficult situations. And when you're the one that solves it for them, you do kind of become their, their hero, their knight in shining armor, and it can be really difficult to pull away. I'll just briefly tackle the larger question of how, when, do you, when, when is the case solved? You know, how, do you, how do you decide how long it goes? Um, and it really depends on the case. I mean, there's been some cases that I've solved in an afternoon uh, just by doing some original research. Uh, some cases, there's a, a famous case of a, the so-called best case for psychic detectives. It took me 18 months to solve, and there's the, the, the chupacabra that took me five years. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes, you know, it, it, it depends on the scope of the investigation, depends on what you're investigating. And again, it, it's, well, I think one of the problems that, that, uh, that TV shows show is that, that people see these shows and they think that my mysteries are solved in, you know, 53 minutes. Uh, and they, oh, if they just go overnight and wander around a, you know, a scary, spooky place, you're going to solve it. Well, no. Sometimes it's like a homicide. Some homicides are solved within a couple hours. Some homicides you know, are solved 20 years later, and some are never solved. So you, you have to be willing to put in the time and the effort to see the investigation through. And so how long does an investigation take? It takes as long as it takes to solve the case. I have always described these paranormal shows on TV as a bunch of inexperienced people with overtuned instruments that they know very little about show up in a very old, creaky, a drafty house and they sit around in the dark until something goes thump. Then they turn on all the lights and scream and run for the doors and that's the end of the program. <laughs> yep. I, I, think, I think one thing that you can do also if you're dealing with people directly when you're doing investigations with them is, is try to just deal with the facts. Don't get caught up in all the emotion uh, because the moment you start getting caught up in the emotion, they feel like you're empathizing with them and now you become their friend and you get a lot of this back and forth. Just deal with the facts of the investigation. What is it that you're investigating? What is it that you're looking for? Um, and you'll find out, you'll, you'll find it a lot easier to be able to step away if you have to at any point because you're just dealing with the facts. Quite often, I'll get five or six pages of something from somebody and I will just reply with one line just dealing with the claim or the fact itself. I don't care about all this other stuff. And I can't care about that because if I do, I'll have so many of those people coming out of the woodwork and now I become their therapist and that's not what I'm there for. And, and oftentimes the, the, the claim comes with all this extra baggage. It's not just that X happened, it's that X happened and by the way, my mother-in-law was in town and let me tell you, we went shopping and then this happened and this, it, it, it turned into these big whole yeah. beautiful you know, long narratives and I'm like, okay, just, <laughs> He's like, what, what exactly happened? Well, let me tell you a story. No, don't tell me a story. Tell me what happened. <laughs> so, uh, Banachek, you mentioned something at the beginning of the panel about the differences between investigations and, say, reports or tests or demonstrations. Yeah, I, I don't, 
I mean, although there's some crossover there, I don't really see like the MDC, the Million Dollar Challenge, I don't see that as really investigation. It becomes that afterwards, it becomes that down the line, and, and, and we have to do our own investigation and make sure we're setting up proper protocol. But that's my, it's very, very different compared to if you're going into a full-blown investigation. Um, you know, we basically have a million dollars for anybody that can demonstrate a paranormal ability under observable conditions. And I have to worry about protocol for those conditions, not so much investigating the entire thing. Can they do it or can't they do it? It's not so much about how they are doing it. Now, when we are done, if they, if, if they pass, then it is how are they doing it at that point. But that should already be covered with the protocol. Yes, Randy? No? Yes? I, I agree. Yeah. Oh, okay. Just want to, yeah. I'm Validation. Um, okay, so one last question and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Um, so these ghost hunters that we see on TV, are they doing paranormal investigations or is it a misnomer? Briefly, no. <laughs> Most of them. No, most of those shows are scripted anyway. And I can tell you right now, really easy way to see if a show is scripted, turn off the volume and just watch it. And you'll be amazed how quickly you can spot that it's all just acting. Uh, you can also see a lot of them have disclaimers at the end of the show. And often they are called a docu-soap, which means we read from a script. Um, so no, they're not actually doing anything. Now, the TV-trained ghost hunter that tries to go out and emulate those shows, um, well, we're, we're talking about the, the, the flexibility of language. Uh, to them, what they're doing is paranormal investigation. Uh, but to them, a skeptic means non-believer cynic. Uh, to us, that's not paranormal investigation, and skeptic means open-minded and willing to find the truth and doesn't take things at face value. So we're almost not speaking the same language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just add that, that yeah, they're, they're not doing investigation, they're not sort of doing sort of investigation that I would recognize as investigation, primarily because investigation, it means to investigate. It means to try and Get to the get to the bottom of or answer a question of. Sometimes this is not what they're doing. Yourself to the point of wetting your pants is investigation. What was that? What was that? Oh my god! Oh my god! That's not investigation. It's uh, it's you know, it's it's you know, 52 minutes of mildly entertaining television in some cases. But you know, the the, the purpose of, of of the actors or participants or whatever you want to call them, the purpose of the show is not to seek the truth. These are not. This is not a documentary. This is not someone trying to solve a mystery. These are people trying to fill. Uh, fill an hour of, of entertainment. That's all they're doing. And those disclaimers that scroll up and up and down the screen so fast at the end, if you slow it down, uh, if you've got a, a TiVo uh, facility in your TV, slow it down and read what they say there. They go so fast that you can't read them. The disclaimers are so comprehensive. They disclaim everything. They take no responsibility for anything whatsoever. Uh, they end up pretty well saying, uh, none of this should be construed as being true. Uh, that, that's what it sums up to when you come right down to it. For entertainment purposes only. Yes, exactly. And Great. there's not much entertainment in it, as far as I can see. All right, we'll open it up to questions from the audience next. George? All right, if you've got a question, come on over here, just like last time. We got time for a bunch? Yeah, we do. We a good 15 minutes. Yeah. Oh, boy. Come oh, on. Here they come. <laughs> we don't want to block sight lines. That's why we do it up this way. Question is, uh, how do you, knowing that these are, every investigation is going to end up in uh, BS, how do you maintain patience uh, in dealing with these people? Well, we're required to. We're, uh, you know, when we do the investigation, you're not talking about the paranormal TV programs, are you talking about us? Anything. Oh, okay, well, we're required to by, by the agreement that we've made publicly that we will investigate these things uh, if and when asked, and particularly for the Billion Dollar Challenge, of course, we have to do it. We're, we're constrained to doing it, and we have to, to terminate it at a proper point, we have to show that they did not meet the requirements of the challenge. And uh, that's not always easily done. And of course, they never, uh, well, very seldom, I can put it that way, very seldom decide after we've shown them that they didn't have the powers, that they don't have the powers. 
I think uh, Ben will probably agree with me on, on this one since we have the, uh, the, uh, the different types of investigations that we have to do, that part of it is be out of education. We want to educate the public exactly what's going on here. And the thing that we have going against us is all of the, uh, the TV programming you know, that says that everything is real, well, they're all ghosts, they're all UFOs, they're all aliens. Uh, so we have to be a little more meticulous about what we do and be patient and uh, turn over every stone. Otherwise, we've, we've failed in uh, being able to educate the public the other direction. I always find I learn something from these. Every single one of them, I learn something. And to me, that's interesting, that's entertaining, and it's knowledge. So it's not like I'm just going in and saying, okay, I know this is BS. And in some instances, I've got to step away from that, but many I do know that it's going to be BS, more than likely walking into it. But I also know that in every individual case, I'm dealing with a kaleidoscope of people here. That it's just, it's amazing what you walk away with. You'll either walk away with a very interesting story or you, you learn something in the process yourself. Um, you may have to do some research and find some information and, and now you become knowledgeable about something that you didn't before. So, so it's never boring. It is never boring. And the only thing I would just add to that is, is in, in terms of my investigations, I don't know that it is BS. Exactly. I, 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 you, you don't know that going in. And yep. if, you, if you assume going into it that it's BS, then you're not doing your job. And that brings us back to the first question, right. really. You can't right. assume right. that. And for, for example, you know, if, I, if I solve a, a famous ghost case that turns out to be you know, a spider on a camera, we can say, well, that's BS, but no, actually, that's a precedent where we can go back and we can say, well, look, if there's another you know, ghost video five years down the road, say, well, look, you can go back and look at, the, look at these solved cases, going back to Randy and Joe and myself and, and Bax and everybody else, you know, we're establishing precedent so that future, investigator, future investigators and future skeptics can go back and look at similar solved cases and say, hey, this is a lot like this other case, maybe that's the answer. Um, obviously, the JREF has the elite of the magic world, um, but there's a lot of young, clever magicians coming up with new techniques, new technologies. How do you guard against the fact that someone may just come up with a, a new technique that you haven't seen before and can pull one on you? I, yeah, I, I, I stay abreast of it. Yeah, I, I mean, I just had, had that discussion with Penn just recently. Um, it's just there is so many new techniques and that. I, I, w in, in some sort of way, we, we are a little bit protected in the aspect that we have a, uh, a, a preliminary and a formal test. So if they pass the preliminary, I, can, I, I have a lot of people that I can go to. I've got a lot of young people, um, and it, we've got, I mean, there's just a lot of people we can speak to and try to find out about the new technology. Uh, did it again. New technologies that are out there. Um, and, and find out and you know what's out there. It, it is scary in this day and age of technology. It's really scary of how quickly things are moving forward. So um, yeah, it, it's a concern, but we try to stay abreast of it. I understand that the title of this forum was how not to conduct investigations, but I'd be interested to hear what advice you would give to somebody who says, we think that there is a haunting going on in this house. How should we conduct the investigation? And to add to that, can you imagine a scenario in which a haunting or the existence of ghosts would be confirmed? No. Well, you'd have to get some definitions going for you. What is a haunting? What is a ghost? And a few things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, every case is individual, though. Absolutely individual. No case is like any other, except on general principles. I think once you know what the claims are, once you know what's happening, I mean, even here you have enough resources to be able to make the right phone calls to get help and find out how you're going to investigate that. I mean, that's a, such an, an encompassing question because ghosts come in supposedly so many different forms. I, I mean, is it a demon? Is it a ghost? Is it a spirit? Well, you know, what is it? Uh, is it hiding in a box? Is it hiding in a mirror? Um, you know, what is the mirror doing? You know, what is my, my doors opening and closing? It just really depends on, on, on what it is that they're claiming. I'll, I'll just add that uh, I actually wrote a book that, t that answers your question called Scientific Paranormal Investigation, How to Solve Unexplained Mysteries, and it actually has uh, pieces by Randy and others here. Uh, and that, it covers a lot there. In terms of like what would, what would be considered evidence of, of a ghost, the example that I think of would be if, if, a pair, if, if ghost investigators go to the White House and they claim that they found, uh, they're getting an EVP, which is basically ghost voices, of say, John F. Kennedy's ghost. And they, if they have a recording of JFK saying something, say, commenting on 
Okay, well, JFK died long before 9-11. Now, now, in this case, we have, we have recordings of JFK, we have his voice prints, we can, we can compare this, and if, if we do, if we really have a, a verifiable audio recording of John F. Kennedy's voice describing some event that happened after his death, is that proof positive of, of ghosts? No, but it's, it's, it's a cool. hell of a lot stronger than anything we got now, so that, that would be a first step. Um, one, one big thing that we see is that you know, when you were talking about if there's a, a house uh, that you believe is haunted, just make sure it's not your own house. That's one of the biggest uh, mistakes that we see is people think that their own house is haunted and they try to start investigating it. And the problem is, is there's nothing as cool as living in a haunted house in your own mind. It, it, man, my house is haunted. So anything you do trying to investigate your own house is gonna be so skewed and so biased that you really do need to talk to some skeptical friends. There are skeptical organizations in every town just about. Uh, and uh, have them over for dinner. My question is, how do you decide what you want to investigate? Because there are so many different ones out there. Like in my field of astronomy, would, how would I know, or how would I make the decision, or how would you recommend you decide, say, should I investigate the latest Electric Universe claim or the latest UFO claim? Or like with uh, what you do with Rocky Mountain Paranormal Society, how do you decide, well, do I invest this haunted house on this street or do I invest this other haunted house? How do you make those uh, judgment calls of setting priorities? That's a difficult one. Um, now, we tend to get the emails and phone calls requesting our help. So uh, for us, it's, it's a matter of wading through them. And a lot of the times, it'll be the people involved that make the decision for us. Because this is a very common scenario. Oh my God, we're being attacked by this ghost and it's doing all these horrible things and the walls are bleeding and there's pea soup all over the place and we need your help immediately. Well, we can be over there about four o'clock. Well, that really doesn't work for us. I've got to pick the kids up. How about, uh, well, I'll check my calendar, get back to you. So they've got the m most horrible thing going on in their house, but suddenly they don't have time because it doesn't fit their schedule. We tend to pass those ones by. Um, if we've got someone that's genuinely scared and we'll put everything aside for us to come take a look at it, we'll jump on that first. But the problem is, is you can open up the newspaper and see the story about the psychic that's coming to visit that you can go get tickets to and, and, and try to catch her or catch him in the act. Um, or there's, there's the story about the, the gym that overnight their security <coughs> camera caught the ghost, you know, uh, traveling across the, the gym. Um, you've got all these things, you can just open up the newspaper and see which one strikes a chord, you know, uh, cattle mutilation, gotta go check that out. They're, they're all right there just waiting for you. So it's got to be about your own passion, your own interests. And there will be something that will align with your own interests somewhere. I, I guess that, that was sort of me asking. I wanted to ask you a question. Were you asking for yourself as to how you select things or how the panel selects things? Well, I mean, specifically me because I'm going to be doing this. But I figured I could learn from how you yeah. choose to select. I, and I guess what you said at the end, it's what, what are you passionate about? because whatever you are passionate about is what you're going to really follow through and, and, and what you're going to be excited about doing. Um, if you're doing a bunch of investigations that you just find boring, you're not going to keep doing it. You're, you're going to go off and do something else. But if you, you find some things that you are passionate about, things that you have knowledge about, that's, I think, probably where you should start. Stu likes chocolate. I know that. And the only thing that I would add to that is uh, go with what the best evidence is. Um, you know, don't waste your time on some tiny little case no one's heard of, there's no good evidence for. I, in, my, in my investigations, I try to go with the cases that have not just sort of somebody saw something somewhere. It's, no, we have, we have video evidence, we have photographs, we have multiple eyewitnesses. The stronger the case, oftentimes, the more interesting it is and the more useful it is. I mean, what, what's the point in spending lots and lots of time on on, you know, my grandmother saw something in the sky in 1978. Okay, good. I mean, you know, have fun with that. I think we have time for two more. Yeah, um, I wanted to uh, go back to the TV shows for a second, um, specifically the, uh, the one factor faked. Um, if you guys could comment on their investigative techniques, because uh, with this show, they do actually, um, you know, th they'll, they'll do these investigations and then we'll find a natural explanation for some of the stuff. But the other things, they'll be like, well, we have inconclusive evidence, or they'll even, they'll even say, well, this seems to be a haunting, right? Um, and, and what I'm curious about is, do you think it's, that's useful, this kind of a show, in the sense that at least they're giving, 
they're finding some natural explanations, but they're also kind of validating that some of this stuff is, you know, genuine. There seems to be evidence even supporting it. You want some inside information on fact or faked? Um, their scientist, Bill Murphy, uh, has never taken a science class in his life. Um, he's a documentary maker. And uh, we got stuck in one of his documentaries, so we, we know him quite well. Um, he is not a scientist. He's about as far as you can get. Now, the thing is, is, is Brian and I made this little uh, video. We were going to kind of make it a viral video for a, a possible TV show we were going to be on. And it had a planchette on a Ouija board move on its own. Well, they contacted us, fact or fake, they contacted us and they said, can you make another one of those where it moves a little more dramatically? Well, we, we were like, we don't know what you're talking about. You know, uh, how, how are we going to do that? We don't know what the spirits are going to do. We don't know when they're going to decide to move this. Um, so we went ahead and we made another one that uh, was, was kind of fun. And uh, they said, well, we, we want it a little more dramatic because we need to, we need to give this to the team uh, to deem real. And uh, they said, you know, we were like, well, we're not going to do that. And they said, well, we'll give you $1,500. Wow. Um, to, to make this video for us so we can give it to the team so they can discover that it's real. There you go, there's your answer. That show is crap. <laughs> Apart from the, uh, the spooky stuff, the ghosts and demons and goblins, does anybody call for say, miracles, uh, weeping virgins, or I, see, I think I see the Virgin Mary in, in my attic. Uh, do you get those kind of calls, and do you approach them any differently? Uh, I just, just for me real quickly, yeah, I, I've, I've investigated miracles and weeping statues and that sort of thing, and, and the answer is no, you don't investigate them. I mean, it, it's all a claim. I don't, I don't care what the claim is. Either there's good evidence for it or there's not, and either there's you know, uh, quantifiable, testable claims or there's not. So I don't, to my mind, a mystery is a mystery, and, and, that, and I approach it the same way. The only real wrinkle in terms of something like that is, is if you're dealing with a religious belief or, or a claim that involves religious beliefs, it's good to have a sort of extra red flag realizing that you're going to be dealing with people who's, you know, if you, que if you question the validity of a weeping statue, this also involves their religious identity. This is not just some abstract thing. You're actually, they may take this as a personal affront to them. Other than that, to me, it's the same. On, on that question, real quick, if it becomes a huge media event, mm -hmm. do you then go investigate it? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if it's if and and to my mind, all the all, that's all the more reason because if you can if you can take a high profile case and you can solve it in in front of the you know the national media, you know, I mean, score one for skeptics. Amen. <laughs> Matt Baxter, Matt and Chick, Ben Radford, James the Amazing Randy, <laughs> Carrie Poppy. Let's hear it for him. Um, before we go, before we go, we had a special story from Randy. Well, I, I thought I would uh, share this story with you folks, and, and perhaps I have told it to many of you before, so please bear with me, but I think it proves the point. You've got to be very careful uh, in accepting and or rejecting something from, particularly from young folks who often uh, are making mistakes. They don't understand quite how their own minds work and how their evidence gathering uh, ability might be a little immature. I'm gonna give you an example of a member of my family, frankly, the only member of my family that I really, really got along with was my paternal grandfather, George. Oh, wonderful gentleman who had been born in Austria, his family moved to uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, and became Danish citizens. Now, many years ago, I had the opportunity of visiting, uh, well, I visited Copenhagen, and I've worked in Copenhagen many times over the years, but I had a chance to visit there with some skeptics who facilitated some things for me, and I found out a great deal about old George. Now, George had, was very, very fond of telling a story about the fact that as a youth living in Copenhagen, he was an only child, and he lived uh, on a street which was quite adjacent to the Royal Palace. And the Royal Palace is quite easily available, uh, that is the grounds outside the palace are quite easily available to pedestrians and they can walk through them. And uh, so it's a, it's a very good democracy in that respect. And uh, little George, uh, he had the job 
of delivering his lunch to his father. Now, his father, my great-grandfather, obviously, uh, he worked in the shipyards, which were on the other side of the royal palace, down on, uh, on the shore, of course. And uh, he, didn't, he left at very, very early hour of the morning, like 5.30 in the morning or so, to get to work. And uh, he didn't have time for his wife to get up and bake the lunch for him. And so it would be put in a, in a, in a paper wrapping, and it would be left for little George when he left for school, he had the job of delivering this to the shipyards and putting it in the hands of his father. Then he would proceed on to school. Now, I had the opportunity of walking along the path that little George used to take many years ago. That's quite an experience, believe me. And uh, little George developed a, a, a phantom companion, a, a mysterious character that she, he said that he knew. Uh, you know how children invent these things, the, the phantom, the ghost of ghost companion, the phantom friend. And uh, so he developed this story and he would delight in telling his uh, family, his, his parents, when he got home, uh, what Mr. Christian had told him. And uh, Mr. Christian, it, uh, it turned out, uh, was a man who rode a great big black horse, a monstrous black horse, and he had uh, people all around him with sabers and such. Oh, how exciting and uh, dogs that were bigger than he himself, little George, was. And uh, this was a great fantasy story, a fantasy companion. And the, the parents would sort of listen and say, yes, George, okay, George. <laughs> great, George, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you, George, eat your dinner, uh, that kind of thing. They didn't pay much attention to it, but they thought it was an innocent aberration of a child. And uh, so the father sat George down one day. And I'm, by the way, I should add that, that Mr. Christian actually passed messages on to the family. And such things as uh, he knew Mr. Christian, apparently he knew that George's father lived in the shipyards, and at one point he gave him some advice saying that uh, the shipyards are going to be moved and that his father should uh, think carefully about whether he wanted to keep his position there. And uh, so he brought this message home. The father said, yeah, yeah, sure, George, okay, eat your supper. Uh, the same thing. And uh, so uh, one day his father sat him down and said, now, George, you're 13 years of age now, and this is ridiculous, having a fantasy companion like this, and people are beginning to talk. They think you're a little little nut. And he said, oh, but it's real, Daddy. You know, it is real. No, 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 George. I don't want to listen to it. I don't want to hear the name of Mr. Christian again, please. I don't want to hear a word about it, okay? Your mother and I are sick and tired of this. Now you've got to grow up, and you've got to drop this fantasy companion. And little George glumly agreed that that was the father's command. Well, uh, a year or so after that, his father one evening unfurled the newspaper at home, and little George looked up in great surprise and pointed to the front page. And the father said, what's up? He said, that's Mr. Christian. And he looked at the front page. It was the birthday of King Christian X of Denmark. <laughs> and the people standing around ahead the swords, and there were great wolfhounds standing beside him. It turned out that my grandfather had been telling the truth all the way along. That was not a fantasy companion. He was talking every morning on his way through the castle courtyard to the shipyard. He would meet the king doing his morning uh, journey around the courtyard <laughs> to, uh, to, to visit some of the, the, the people, the citizens who had petitions to give him, you see. George had been telling the truth. He had been talking with Christian X of Denmark, the king of Denmark, of the whole damn country, every morning of his life when he went to school. He was telling the truth, and he, he, he told me that his father's attitude improved radically after that. <laughs> I thought I would share that with you because sometimes the kids are right. They aren't having fantasy companions, and they aren't making up stories. Sometimes there can be some truth at the base of it, so beware. <laughs> Thank you, James.